Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Living Power. This is your online Bible study where we are walking through the Bible in a year. This is May 22nd. And before we get started today, looking at Solomon and the building of the first temple in Jerusalem, I wanted to offer a word of encouragement to you. I know many of you are committed to sticking with the study all year long, and we do go all year long. We go Monday to Friday. We even read on the weekends uh, all year long because we are walking through the Bible in a year. And my prayer for you is that this would just be an amazing walk um, in Bible study as it has never been before. You know, studying the Old and New Testaments together is absolutely um a thrilling experience because it really helps you to see a 30,000 foot view of how the Testaments work together and what the plan of salvation um, really means to us because you can't study, I can't be serious with this cat right here, but you really can't study one in isolation of the other and get the full meaning um, and the to understand the mystery of what God is is really doing and how great our God really is. So uh, I want to encourage you some days I know that you can't um, can't watch the videos um, some of, for some of you because you um, it's just impossible but for many of you you're faithful and you are watching the videos each and every day and so um, I praise God for all of you regardless of where you are in um, you know, in, in the video, some of you have had to skip a few and you've just joined us where we are. And I think that's fantastic. If, um, if you're going on vacation, uh, this summer, I know many of you have plans to get away and go on vacation and that is perfectly, uh, fine. Uh, take me with you because these videos are certainly portable. I just encourage you to entrust it to the Holy Spirit. Um, just try to do your readings each and every day, and I will be here with you um, whenever you're able to watch those. So thank you for um, allowing me to Bible study with you. It certainly is my privilege. Today's lesson is called Equip for the Work. And this is for us as well. Whatever God is calling you to do, He is equipping you to do it. You are adequately prepared because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. I've given you a couple pictures today. I've showed you the, uh, the size of the temple so you can kind of get an idea of that. The um, picture of the temple and the palace. And um, I hope that kind of gives you um, a visual that helps you learn about um, this magnificent structure. How many years did Solomon take for the entire construction project, the temple and his palaces and the, um, the courtyard and everything? 20 years, that's right, seven and a half to build a temple. He continues on 13 more years building a palace for himself, a palace for his wife, the Pharaoh's daughter, Egypt's Pharaoh, and the um, courtyards and the rooms around the temple and all that. Now, when I read that, I wondered, why did he spend more time building his own house than he did God's house? And I was a little uh, down on him when I was thinking about that. Wow, isn't that just like us? You know how we would build, um, spend more time building something for us than we would for God. Then I realized, I read something that made me think maybe I was being too hard on Solomon. David prepared for the building of the temple. And he, during his lifetime, got a lot of materials and a lot of things together, which I believe actually helped speed up the process. When we plan and prepare, and it's amazing how quickly we can get something done. I believe the temple project, if David hadn't prepared all that in advance, would have taken maybe even longer than 13 years. There had been no preparations made for his palace and those things. And so maybe that's why. So let's give Solomon some grace here as we realize the temple came um, together so quickly. The temple was built in seven years. We've talked about um, numbers and how numbers are important before in the class. The number seven denotes complete. And we see the number three, the number seven, the number 40 over and over again in scripture. And whenever we see that, 
that is a sign for us that God was part of that and ordained that time period for his purposes. So here, seeing that the temple took seven years should not surprise us. That is the number of completeness. All right, Solomon um, creates the Hall of Pillars, the Hall of Justice, where he rules. I guess people bring in court cases to him, and he rules in justice. And we mentioned the palace for Pharaoh's daughter as well. We learn a little bit more about the um, man who is the craftsman that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit to do these wonderful works of bronze. Let's talk just a minute about what it is that he has created. He's created two pillars, which actually mark the entrance to the temple. You'll see that in the picture that I've given you today. They are 27 feet tall and 18 feet around. They have pomegranates and water lilies on top. They name them. One is named Jachin, which means God establishes. The other is named Boaz, which means he is strength. Certainly they are commemorative of the fact that they are trusting in God and relying on him for um, the plans and purposes of Israel and the strength of Israel. This basin, a lot of talk about the basin. Did you uh, realize that? This basin is a huge almost as big as a swimming pool, but they don't swim in it. It's for purification purposes, and they use this water for the purposes at the temple. It's 15 feet across, 7 half feet deep, has decorative gourds all around it, and underneath of it <clears throat> are 12 bronze oxen. So this man was able to carve these oxen and all this decoration all over it. It was so big, did you get the name? What did they call it? The sea, S-E-A, the sea held 11,000 gallons of water. It was positioned at the southeast corner of the temple and it served simply as a reservoir. That was pretty amazing. It's in the picture that I share with you today. This craftsman also made 10 water carts, 10 small basins, 10 golden lampstands which sat inside the holy place. Five were on the south wall, five were on the north wall. Remember there was no um, no artificial light inside the holy place and so they would go in and these lampstands which we talked about before represent the ministry of the Holy Spirit um, would illuminate the um, inside of the temple and was just absolutely gorgeous especially because remember there were <clears throat> stones overlaid with wood overlaid with gold and when you had that candlelight reflecting off of the gold, it would have just been brilliant to look at. Ten tables, and he made wash basins, shovels, bowls, all the utensils as well. Today we see we have a treasury. And this was something that Solomon established was a treasury. I want you to love, fall in love with the treasury now. And all of these things that have been made that sit inside the temple. Something bad is going to happen to all of these magnificent pieces that exist in the temple. And so without spoiling it for you, just fall in love with them now and enjoy them now while you can. Solomon also established 12 administration districts throughout the empire, the kingdom. They did not correspond to the territory of the tribes. He didn't want there to be tribal warfare, so he didn't make, it's kind of like the United States and how we would have, we divided our country into states. He didn't divide his kingdom into these tribes. He divided the administration districts a little bit differently. Um, he also established a taxing system, and that's what the administration district uh, had to do with um, the, the way that the people were taxed. Each district had to support his royal household one month out of the year. And in some commentaries I read, it said some, in some cases, it took months for them to work to be able to pay their portion in some cases, they were working half the year to support their own families and half the year to support Solomon's royal household. Kind of sounds like our taxation system today where some people are taxed a third of what they make. That's, that's a lot. So this was a huge undertaking, a huge obligation. Remember, Solomon ends up having 700 royal wives and 300 concubines. And we're going to get to that. And so this was just this, this huge royal household. 
I want to contrast David and Solomon for just a minute because this is this is really interesting. If you think about uh, Solomon's father, David, and how he differed from Solomon, this is important for us to understand. David was a rough and tough fighter. He killed a lion with his bare hands. He killed um, he killed men with his bare hands. Um, of course, he did it as um, you know, in a holy war. He was lenient to traitors. He never, uh, he had twice the opportunity to kill Saul who was pursuing him, but he never did it. He did not um, take the position of God. He always let God be God in his life. This man uh, played the harp, wrote songs, danced in front of everyone. And um, he, he has been called in one of the books I was reading. It was like this. David could be likened to the American frontier evangelist who spoke in tongues and vision and dreams and was charismatic and would be able to um, remember he had three people that loved him so much that they risked their life going into be to the town of Benjamin just to or um, Bethlehem just to give him some water that he wanted from this well. Um, he was so charismatic and he just had this love for the Lord. He desired to be filled with the Holy Spirit through his whole life and um, be in communion with the Lord like none other. He was called a man after God's own heart, if you remember. Solomon was an executive fixated on size. Oh my goodness, the number of horses that he had, the number of wives that he had, the opulence of his palaces. And when we're going to learn it this week, when Queen Sheba comes to visit him, she is amazed at the opulence in his robes and fine clothes and all of the little, I'll call them trappings. He doesn't know they're trappings, but they're trappings that... Um, his, his finery and the, the chalices that he drinks out of are pure gold. It's a well-organized empire that he has, but he's starting to wield power over the Israelites, and we don't see anyone in Scripture risking their life for him. He is as powerful as Pharaoh, maybe even more so, which is indicative of the fact that Pharaoh gives Solomon his daughter to marry, which the Pharaohs in ancient days would never have done anything like that. Solomon in one of the books that I read was described in today's terms as a suburban megachurch pastor who's shepherding a huge congregation into a plush auditorium convinced that the size of their church and the size of their kingdom is because of God's blessing. Interesting to think about. We will watch as Solomon continues to grow his horses and his household and his kingdom and to the point where perhaps um, he has to resort to, um, well, I don't want to spoil it, but it doesn't necessarily end the way he thinks it's going to end. And when we get into Ecclesiastes and some of the Proverbs, we're going to really understand. Remember, this is a man who's who has more wisdom than any other man and we're going to be able to study the conclusion that he's come to. Right now he's fixated on building and he's in, engrossed in size and gold and opulence and ambition. Many of us get trapped in that same position as well, don't we? Where we think that things and material possessions and um, you know the position that we hold in our job and um, the size of our home and all of all of these things, maybe we have two or three homes and we're building, 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 and we think that that's the most important thing. But from Solomon's life, we're going to see that maybe that's not the most important thing, and maybe that leads down a road that we simply didn't expect. So my prayer for you is that you would seek God with your whole heart, first and foremost, above everything else, and that you would allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and release you of the trappings that the world can um, so secretively and silently kind of get us into and we don't even realize it. My prayer for you is that your heart would be free, free to completely love the Lord above all else. And that certainly is a challenge in our culture, is it not? And in the world that we live in.
Well, I pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you. We're going to continue with the administration of Solomon in the glory days of Israel. I hope that you will uh, stay with me this week. Blessings to you and your family. Shalom.